It's a month now since we last shared together a study in the prophet Habakkuk. And so it's, I think, important for me to remind you where we've come from so we can understand the passage that we've just read together. Habakkuk has identified himself with the world in anguish. He's looked out on the world as he sees it in his day. Uh, he sees the oppression. He sees the violence both on the international and national scale stage uh, in the lives of individuals. And he is anguished by the anguish of others. So, of course, should we be? Where violent oppression rules the day, we should be concerned. Where compassion is absent, we should be troubled. But what troubled Habakkuk more than the anguish of people and peoples was the fact that God appeared to be indifferent. He appeared to be powerless and inactive in the face of these things that were a travesty of what his world was designed to be and was in conflict with the very nature of the God he'd revealed himself to be as the Holy One of Israel. Ultimately, the answer that Habakkuk received and we've seen this as we've been undertaking these studies together, is that the Lord is not inactive, and that in due time in the messianic kingdom to come, the kingdom of the Christ, all will be put right. Evil will have its end. The oppressors will be forced to stand speechless before the revelation of the holiness of God, and the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. So far, so good. As we began our study of chapter 3 last time, we noticed that this last chapter is a song. It's Habakkuk's response to what God has revealed to him. And in the first couple of verses, we noticed that Habakkuk looks to past and present experience, both his own past and present experience, and also the past and present experience of God's people, and indeed world history as a whole, to confirm that the Lord is always true to himself. And so it is that Habakkuk, making that statement, adds to it yet a prayer, Lord, this is true of you. We believe it. Please do something now. You see, there is a place uh, in our faith, both for affirming God as the one who is in control and whose purposes do not waver and whose compassion uh, is always to be there and is being worked out in his world. There is a place for believing that and at the same time saying, Lord, do something now. And sometimes we feel like that ourselves, don't we? We found ourselves in situations where uh, we've come to acknowledge who God is, but we just long for him to make, sure, make known who he is to us now. Now what follows in the verses that we read uh, together this morning is something that's called a theophany. That's a technical word uh, for describing the uh, 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 God's appearance in a human manner. A theophany is God appearing in a human manner so that we can describe in our own words something about what we saw of him, though he transcends all words and all understanding. Now the ancient world was familiar, as I suppose our world is too, of uh, victory processions. 
they were familiar with the conqueror coming uh, in back to his capital city with all the plunder associated with him, uh, with the subdued peoples following him, uh, with his royal guard accompanying him, uh, with a, a panoply uh, of glory surrounding him to celebrate his victory. We do something similar, don't we? Uh, perhaps these days we, do, we tend to associate it less with uh, victory and more with royal weddings. But we know uh, the sort of picture uh, of grandeur and splendour and majesty that was familiar from the ancient world uh, and we experience even today. Well, can I suggest to you that's the picture we have in verses 3 and through to 7. The problem is it's in poetry and because it's poetry it's difficult to translate and uh, it's difficult to know exactly sometimes what's going on and frankly if you had an experience of God that was as transcendent as Habakkuk's was it would be pretty tough to put it into words for you too and for me. We would stumble to put into words exactly what we saw but this is what we find here. So what happens? First of all, there is a reference to Taman and to Paran. For those of you who are Bible students, you will know that this is a veiled reference to the, to the mountain of Sinai. Uh, so the God who had made himself known to Sinai to God's people many centuries before now comes out from Sinai and he's celebrated, you notice, uh, by those around him. His glory covered the heavens and his praise fills the earth. It's as though both the heavenly choirs and the earthly choirs are joined together to celebrate this appearing, appearance of the God of Israel. Choirs always accompany these great events, don't they? Uh, and here you have the heavenly choirs and the earthly choirs uh, uh, responding one to the other in the celebration of the appearance of the God who made himself known at Sinai. And such was his splendour that it eclipsed the sunrise itself. His splendour was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Now verse 5 is reference to plague and pestilence. Uh, probably this is reference to uh, some of the deities of the ancient world uh, who were, as you know, uh, in Egypt, that they were sometimes plagues and other forms, were worshipped as gods in order that they might somehow uh, look favourably upon the worshipper. But plague goes before him. Pestilence follows his steps. You see, uh, even those things to which other people might uh, offer divine status, they are now subject to him and either go before or behind him uh, in order to emphasise just how sovereignly great he is. Not surprisingly then, when he arrives at his destination and stands to view the crowds assembled, the glory that surrounds him, we're told he stood and the earth shook. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled, the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. And I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish, the traditional enemies of Israel, those who symbolised some of the oppression that concerned Habakkuk so deeply, he saw them in utter distress. What an awesome picture of unchanging, glorious, all-powerful deity.
In the light of what I've just said to you, hear it again. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth, he looked and made the nations tremble, the ancient mountains crumble. The age-old hills collapse, but he marches on forever. And I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. This, says Habakkuk, is our unchanging God. Now, the question that applies to us today is this as we seek to apply it to ourselves. Is Habakkuk's vision looking backwards, forwards, or is it a description of the hidden realities of today? Now clearly Habakkuk is referring to events in the past, uh, and he's drawing his imagery from the past. So you could argue he's looking back. Some of the language here relating to the ancient mountains crumbling and the age-old hills collapsed uh, is language that's used elsewhere in Scripture to refer to the coming kingdom of the Christ. So it could be looking forward. It could be that he's using the language of the past to refer to the future. But I would like to suggest to you that actually past, present and future here coalesce. Oh yes, the anguish appears to look back and the mighty warrior who is revealed does appear to be uh, one who uh, aptly describes the one we still expect. And the past seems to secure the future too. The fact that God has done this in the past uh, and that Habakkuk deliberately uses language from the past to speak of the future uh, secures the future truth. If God has acted thus before, God will act thus again. But I suggest that the message is addressed to you and to me too. If we are on the Lord's side, if we are servants of the King, our King, King Jesus, this God is our God. This God is our God in our own circumstances. This is the God who is at work uh, in your trials and your tribulations and your difficulties this is the God who is at work unerringly, perfectly, compassionately in your circumstances and mine. And as we reflect upon these words uh, relating to our own church, it's true for us too. This is our God. This is the one who marches on forever, who doesn't abandon his people, doesn't abandon his cause, who will be glorious and glorified among his people. And this is our God who is still at work in our world. This is the God who is working out his purpose as years succeed to year. He will be glorified. He marches on forever. He is working out his loving, compassionate purposes. And he will not fail us individually. He will not fail our church, 
and he will not fail his word. And that's the confidence that we, I think, are intended to bring from this passage in Habakkuk, remembering yet the context in which it is said. Habakkuk is burdened. He is blinded to what God appears to be doing by the complexity of his circumstances and the circumstances of the world in which he finds himself. And the answer that ultimately he reaches uh, is not that he can dot every I and cross every T and know exactly what the answer is. But it is to recognize that the God who is God is not inactive. He's not disinterested. He is at work as the sovereign of all. And he will not have his purposes uh, brought to an end. His promises are secure. His word stands. Let's pray together. We thank you, our Father, for this majestic passage in the Scriptures tucked away in this obscure little book by your servant Habakkuk, and yet speaking so clearly to our own situation as individuals, as a church, and as a world. Lord, grant us the security of faith that Habakkuk himself had in the face of the things that so troubled him, that we may never lose sight of the fact that whatever the circumstances may present themselves as, you are not idle, you are not disinterested, but you are the sovereign God who loves his word and who loves us. Hear us then as we ask that you would meet us in our needs, especially uh, in those situations that cry out, we cry out to you for help today. For we ask it in the name of our King Jesus. Amen. Amen.